Hey everybody, this is Brian Yellow. On episode number 57 of Origin Stories on Creativity, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Jennifer Brozak. Ms. Brozak is a little bit like looking into the sun. She's that type of author that everybody wants to be. She's multi-talented. She's an editor. She's a tie-in writer. She's constantly working. She's worked with one of my favorite authors, Margaret Weiss. She's done work on Shadowrun. She's done work on Vampire the Masquerade. She's done work on D&D titles. She's constantly got titles in the work. She's constantly publishing. She's got anthologies. She's got video game tie-ins. Just jealous of the effort that she is producing. And it shows. I mean, if you look at her author page on Amazon.com, it's endless. And it is impressive. And so is she. When you talk with her, it the the level of intelligence that that she displays not only in how she can discuss writing but the way she can recognize the the industry itself it was a really good conversation and I'm just very very impressed that she was willing to sit with me and and discuss writing and and what writing means to her uh, and with no further ado this is Jennifer Broza. As a writer, uh, a creator, um, I'm always trying new things. Uh, so Five Minute Stories is based on flash fiction that I wrote. Um, most of it I wrote a long time ago uh, to teach myself to write tight and short. And I used to, yeah. it used to be called uh, Freaky Friday Fictions. Every Friday I would write a flash fiction based on something that happened in my life. And then I would kind of twist it into something supernatural. And I broke all the rules of writing. I, I killed off friends and family and coworkers <laughs> and just did things you're not supposed to. And I did it for about two years, two and a half years. Uh, I got friends asking me to Two and a half years or so. About what? Uh, 250, uh, 250 pieces, something like that, or 150 yeah. pieces? Uh, and when I was done, uh, two different publishing houses came to me and said, hey, can we publish this collection? Wow. And so I ended up doing, it was originally called In a Gilded Light, and we did 105 flash fiction pieces. That particular book is out of print. So I took some of my favorite from that, and I, took, I wrote some new stories, and I put it on five-minute stories because... One of the when I started investigating the whole concept of a podcast, since I've been enjoying them, mm -hmm. I talked to people like Alistair. Uh, oh gosh, what's his last name? He is man of words on Twitter. Well, you know what? I have the computer right in front of me. I can look up his name because <laughs> a man of words. A man of words, Alistair. Alan Stewart. Yeah, Alistair. Stewart. He's um and he owns Escape Artist, Escape Podcast through the Pod, Podcastle, that whole thing that have been it's around. Man of Words Twenty One? No. No, man. Uh, let's see. Actually, it's Alistair Stewart. Let me let me send this to you because the man. I love Al Alistair is like a great name. Oh, he's English, so his there it is. I put it in the chat. Uh, he, uh, I've met him at a couple of world cons and he has been super um, supportive. And one of the things he said was most people don't, don't realize how hard it is to get content for a podcast. And so I thought, well, I have a lot of content here. I can, and I own all of it. So let me see if I like doing podcasts. Uh, and so I use the five minute stories because I listen to a lot of podcasts, but sometimes I don't have a, a time to listen to the hour long or 45 minute long ones. I tend to go for 30 minutes or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So nine but, minutes for me. When I look for podcasts, I usually go. I love Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's my favorite. It's like the three hour Bob, you know, jobs and that I I do the dog walks. Ten minutes, I come back, take the earbuds out, it stops. I go right back into it when I have something else. I'm one of the, cause it's like a bookmark, you know, I like the big, long, thick books too. You put the bookmark in, you come back to it later on. Whereas I'm, I, I'm do, all, I do a lot of short stories. I edit a lot of anthologies. I like, oh, really? like the shorter, more experimental stuff. That mm -hmm. way I can experiment. Uh, and if I don't like it, I don't like it. Some voices just don't jive with me. Oh, I gotcha. Let me ask you about short fiction because I'm a, I'm a big short fiction writer myself right now too. I'm working on a novel, but I also do the short fiction on a monthly basis. I have a hard time getting into short fiction, like reading it. What do you think well, the question drives? Is, go ahead. So where, are you, where, where are you reading the short fiction? Um, well, I'm really trying to find the medium. Um, the, the the magazines out there that that appeal to me um let's see clark's world right now tour is pulling me a little bit i think tour right now has has their finger on the pulse of, got the uh, novellas, yes uh, the, the novella line is the novella length is coming into a new resurgent mostly because of the phone readers and the kindle readers uh the the people who commute online um, I, I recommend places like Apex, um, and then there's Apex and Abyss, there's uh, Fireside Fiction, there's... Uh, I just put a piece into Apex. Yeah, Strange Horizons. Strange Horizons, okay. Beneath Ceaseless Skies. Well, no, no, the question I was going to ask you, though, is what do you think a good beginning is? What do you think hooks a reader? Is it the first sentence? Is it the first well, paragraph? Is it the first page? Well, what do you think a, a great beginning for a short story is? A great beginning is in media res. It, it's, it starts in the middle of the action. Nobody really cares about the, the delivery driver uh, delivering the package. And if you're spending three paragraphs or four paragraphs talking about the weather and the guy who's delivering the package and the package gets on the porch and then we never see this guy again and we don't care that it's raining outside that's that's terrible what we care yeah. about is the package what we uh, with short fiction you have to get right into the action immediately now mm -hmm. by action i mean importance you can spend three paragraphs of someone staring at a package having very complicated thoughts about whether or not they're going to open it uh, and, and you know, no one's shooting at them. No one's. Uh, it's not a ticking bomb, though. It could be an emotional bomb. It's. It's what draws a person in, where they can identify with the reader or the premise immediately as something interesting. Uh, when I read slush, generally I discover most inexperienced short story writers don't know how to actually start a story, mm -hmm. and they would do very well to cut the first three to four paragraphs and summarize it in a line or two. That's a very good point. And then how do you end it, right? That's also very important. How do you begin it? How do you stop it? Because a how lot of short fiction reads like a chapter. Right. It, it, part of something bigger. And that's really a big problem with short fiction. And sometimes that's that works well if it's designed to be within uh, an expanded universe. So if uh, someone like I don't know Brenda Cooper is writing for writing a short science fiction story for her her series, um, a lot of the people who will be going to that will know the universe already. But a good author will have enough for uh, people brand new to their to the world that they'll be able to pick it up and as for ending the story you end it i always say you end it before the dinner goes cold <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a visiting family you have a day for travel you stay there for three days you have a day for travel you leave while every while everyone is really still happy with each other Hmm, it's very interesting. My wife always likes to tell me that my my short my my real flash fiction in a car 
and it's zooming past a scene and you just kind of get a glimpse of something happening and then you're off wondering what you just glimpsed. And I always wonder, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know what I mean? In terms of an audience, who are you writing for? You know what I mean? Are you writing for that person who's looking to be entertained? Writing for other writers? Because as a, as a writer, I'm reading uh, Apex, I'm reading Tor, I'm reading, I'm looking for short fictions to educate myself as a writer. So it's hard for me to pull away from it, pull away from the art of it, the, the, the skill base. Well, I think that if you're looking uh, for the, the art of the, the skill of a short story and you want to read it as a reader, I would actually go outside your normal genre. That's if you're point. a science fiction and fantasy person, you go and read some mystery and you see how they open the story and how they end it. Whereas um, if you want to read for pleasure, and, and I have to admit, as an editor and an author, there are very few authors that pull me out of, of the editor mode or the investigator mode where I'm always seeing what they are doing. Mm -hmm. um, Kadri is one of those authors. He does a very good job with the Sandman Slim series. Who's the author again? I'm sorry, you, you broke up Richard on me. Richard Kadri. Richard Kadri? Yes. You are, uh, you write all over the place, don't you? Like looking at, <laughs> you write from, I mean, what am I looking at here? I know you write horror because that's where your podcast is going to be investigating in terms of uh, your nine minute shorts or your nine minute, uh, your, uh, your, I'm sorry, is it nine minute shorts? Five. Your flashes. Five. Five minute stories. Yeah, that's, that's horror. And I discovered you in the science fiction subreddit on Reddit. Yes, I, I, yes. I write science fiction, urban fantasy, apocalyptic fiction. Uh, I do write uh, occasionally historical horror. Um, oh, wow. That's an interesting one. What's historical horror? Uh, well, I used to write for a, a, a game called Colonial Gothic. And it is, well, the game itself is basically as historically accurate as you can get until a point. And then you have an entire series of uh, supernatural things that have linked into uh, uh, historical actions. Like you can't mess with George Washington, but you can write stories around the the trip a, across the Potomac. Um, so I do a little bit of that. Um, I, I do a lot of tie-in fiction, um, you know, writing for Shadowrun and BattleTech and V Wars and Predator and such. So the only thing I don't think I can officially say I write at this moment is I don't write the traditional romance, and that's not because it's a bad thing. It's just it's not my my milieu. And right now I've never written a traditional mystery or a cozy, and I really want to write one of those. So you like history? Oh, I do. Obviously. Yeah. Yes. I, I do mean, like when. Go ahead. I do like history, but I, I won't want to write an historical, um, his, writing historically or even alternate historical fiction mm -hmm. is got way too much research to do. <laughs> well, had you, are you a turn and burn type of author? Do you like to write quickly and get it out as fast as you can? I am, I am a, yes, I do write as fast as I can on short fiction and long. And then I'm, I call it a, I'm a putter inner. I don't cut. Uh, most people write too much to begin with. I write a bare bones uh, skeleton of a story. And then I layer in um, secondary arcs and I layer in uh, details, especially details that I, um, I'll get, you know, a third of the way in the story and go, oh, I need to remember to put that detail back in the first chapter. And um, I, I do try to write as fast as possible because as much as I dislike revision, yeah, it's so much easier to write when you're in the edit phase because the bulk of the, the there's no tyranny of the blank page in front of you. You have, oh, the yeah, now. I'm totally the blank page is scary for everybody, I would imagine, for me especially, but I am totally editing all the time. <laughs> from well, from first word to last word, I'm always editing. I'm, that's the type of writer I am. 
but yeah. No, and that, that. There, there are very, to me, there are very few authors who can do that very well. Um, Maxwell Alexander Drake does that very well, uh, but he's also dyslexic, so he has a very hard time reading afterwards. Uh, so, unless this, I always recommend that you write as fast as you can, and that you get back into where, what you were doing the next day is you go up three paragraphs and you edit those three paragraphs so that by the time you're at the end of it, you know where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be writing. And then you just go into the flow of it. Interesting. Yeah, too much editing. The editor, the, the you are usually, well, okay. Most of the time we are harder on ourselves than anybody else. When it comes to writing, that that is only sometimes true, but the inner critic can sabotage the writer. Yeah, I, so, I totally get that. With my current book, the, and the inner editor is destroying me. Well, then <laughs> you need to stop editing as you're going. You need to write as fast as you can. Now, are you a pantser or do you outline? No, I'm a pantser. I write by the seat of my pants in fact i just discovered recently i'm sixty thousand words in and i realized oh crap my bad guy doesn't even show up until the middle of the novel and i just reintroduced him to the beginning of the novel i mean that's how i write <laughs> and i just discovered what my ending is going to be and um yeah, that's how i write that's how I, I, I write everything yeah i can't do that anymore uh especially when i have deadlines and especially if i'm doing tie-in fiction they have the my publishers uh, need to approve the outline because yeah. I'm writing in their world. And I've also so how does somebody like me get into um, a situation like, say, um, this novel that I'm writing now becomes popular and a publisher wants to take me on contract or however, however that works. Am I screwed later on down the road I, because I, I write like this, because I write chaotically and I don't really even know what my story is until my story is on paper, first, so, second draft? Let me put this out first before I explain some things. This is just the way things have happened to me. I, I am not the one golden rule. Uh, I am not giving the uh, advice from on high. I am giving you my perspective. So I'm going to put that caveat mm -hmm. out there first. Now, um, what I have discovered as both a, an editor and a publisher and an author is um, junior authors have the hardest time doing their second novel. Yeah, this is my second right now. Well, I mean, okay. uh, on, contract. on contract. On contract, okay. So here's the thing. You may take five years to write your first novel, and it may be a humdinger of a novel, and you get an agent, and you get the, the American dream of the traditional publishing. Most likely, your contract is going to include a, a sequel or a two sequels make it a trilogy now to do that well one you have to have written a good book two you have to have written something down that says I know what this next book is going to be whether it's a two to three paragraph thing or a full-on um, three-page double space synopsis uh, what if you don't want to write sequels, sequels. Ooh, ooh. okay well now that is possible uh, Joe Hill did that. Now, you don't have to write a sequel, but you have to be able to show that you can write another book because a lot of publishing houses are looking investing in the author, not just their project. For example, I have a women's literary epistolatory novel out with my agent right now. It is a strange little novel that I wrote one year that is not genre based at all. I don't even kill a lot of people in it. And if anybody reads my stuff, they know I kill a lot of people fictionally. <laughs> the thing that I tell her is if somebody picks up that book, I know what the second book would be. It would not be a sequel to the first book. It, but I know what it is. And I was able to tell her what it would be. Now I have written nothing of it, mm -hmm. but I have the idea. So it's publishers are looking for the big, the, the, the next big thing. They are looking to invest in their authors. So you need to not only be able to tell 
your agent or the publisher, if you go indie or if you go um, small press, what the next book is, you have to be able to produce within a specific amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, I'm Are you on a, do you have, I hear my own voice. Hold on one second. I'm actually afraid to ask any questions because I might be hearing, I heard my voice just shoot back in my own ears. Well, okay, I can't okay. hear it echoes, but I can plug in my headset. Please, please do, because I will get a feedback, and one of the worst things is hearing my own voice this way. I, I don't mind when I edit myself, but man, I can't, I can't participate if I hear my own voice shoot back at me. <laughs> Let's see. All right, what about this? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Are you still hearing me as before? Uh, perfectly as before. Just I can't hear myself, so which is perfect. All right. I'm going to try something. All right. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, well, that didn't work. Uh, talk to me now. Uh, um, well. Okay. No, that. Uh, all right. So that didn't work. Uh, maybe I'm plugged into the wrong thing. Uh oh. Okay. How's this? Let's can see. you hear me? Why is I can this... hear you. Okay, I am not getting it to come through my mic, my headset. That's odd because I wasn't able to get my mic to go through the headset either on my wife's computer. That's why I had technical difficulties, which is interesting. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Can you hear um, an echo? Can you, are you hearing an echo of your own voice? No. Nope. No, you're not. I'm nope. okay right now. Um, maybe we'll be okay. It might pop up again. If you hear me yelp in pain, it's because I've just had my voice shoved into my ears. <laughs> okay. Um, oh man. So let's get back on track. What were we talking about? Oh, I, the question that I wanted to, to shoot at you, you were talking about small presses and being traditionally published. Um, and I wanted to throw at you, what about being independently published? I mean, it looks like you're a traditionally published author. I have do, you have an, uh, do you have an opinion about being independently published? You know, being a, a, an author publisher is just as valid as being traditionally published, which is just as valid as being small press published. This is the perfect time to pick which style of publication you want. I do it all. I do self-published, uh, I do small press, and I do big five. Do you think that the publishing houses are are faring well for their authors going forward? I mean, I've talked to a few authors who win contests or whatever, and they just kind of do the same thing that we do. You know, I'm not we being that I'm bundling myself up with some really hardworking people who market the living crap out of themselves and talk to bookstore owners and make art and shake hands and get themselves out for book signings and make, you know, bookmarks and just get themselves into schools. And man, they just work their butts off. It's amazing how much effort they put into selling their books and it really pays off. Um, but the authors who, you know, win these con contests or get traditionally published, they just kind of, now what? Now what, so, guys? Do you know what I mean? Here is the sad fact for every single author out there, with the very, very small exception of the, the top 1%. If you're not J.K. Rowling or Stephen King or George R.R. R. Martin, you are doing publicity for your book. You are doing blog tours. You are doing, if you're lucky, you're doing uh, book tours that your publishing house is paying for. Uh, you are creating some uh, swag out of your own pocket. Sometimes it's bookmarks. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, little cards that you can pass out. The, the question, it's, it's not, if you don't know how to market yourself and you win, I don't know, a contest for like uh, the Kindle contest thing, um, you're not going to find as much of the audience as you want. The benefit to going with a publishing house, especially if they know how to market, is that they will put some marketing dollars behind you. But 
they have their, their stars and then they have the, the mid list. While the mid list will get a little bit of, of marketing dollars, most of the, the money comes off of the, the top 10%. They, they market to the top level. So as every author out there, and, and it, it sucks, but you have to do it. You have to be accessible. You have to be able to talk on some sort of social media. You have to be willing to do podcasts and um, written blog tours and go to conventions, meet your yeah. fans. Yeah, it's interesting because you really, like like we, um, what, like we, you spoke of in the very beginning of this podcast, the content, finding people to talk to on a podcast, finding the pod, podcast themselves, the people willing to, to speak to you. Um, finding the conventions, finding ways to find an audience, to to speak, to work, to find an audience. Well, it, it is and it isn't. The first thing I always tell everyone is to be a, a real person on social media. You should not be trying to sell your book 100% of the time or even 50%. Yeah. A good, a good um, rule of thumb is between no more than 25 to 30 percent of any posts should involve you know buy my book most of the time you should be talking about yourself your cat i'm at uh i'm at zero percent <laughs> I'm, I'm at zero i feel so awkward mentioning it at mentioning well, it i do okay, not so even i don't even gauge with it i just leave it on amazon and you know how many copies i've sold one i think my wife bought one and i don't know who bought the other one well, so I, I don't I don't engage with it. I just, I don't. And it's not paid off at all. At all? What's that? Are you on social media? Yeah, on Twitter. I, I love Twitter. I'm on Reddit too, but I don't know if that counts as social media. And then obviously I'm on uh, YouTube as well. You know, I've got, you're my 57th podcast. And, you know, I love engaging with other authors and talking about their marketing schemes. But man, I do not want to give up the anonymity of uh, my personal life. I do not want people to judge me as a, uh, you know, um, a shark or anything like that. And selling my novel just makes me feel so horrible about myself. So Honestly, I just, about and that. you know what it is also those people who sell their books, like every single tweet, they make me feel bad for myself. You know what I mean? Putting myself out in that way would just make me feel really awful but you don't have to put yourself out like that what you do is you talk about oh you that you talk about something about your writing process or you talk about your cat or your dog or you talk about <laughs> the fact that you stubbed your toe or that after 56 podcasts for some reason your your, your stupid computer absolutely will not do this thing with your microphone and there, there was a, you know, the joke that millennials are killing everything, including advertising. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's people don't want ads; they want stories, and that's and they do. That's true. Exactly. So like but I, it does. I don't know why it doesn't help. I mean, it, I don't know why the writing is invisible, and I don't think I'm alone in that either. There was a uh, an interesting meme not too long ago. It was a segregated little nine square cartoon with various different types of writers. There was the writer that wrote something, got very excited because now he can go out and sell immediately. The writing was something to sell and he could go out and market the crap out of it. There was the writer who wrote because, you know, he loved the, the, the genre. And there was the, the writer who was, angry. you know, he lost the artistic whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm the, the guy in the, the basement trying to, you know, I just I'm horrible at the marketing part of it. I kind of get embarrassed. I don't, I maybe, I have no clue. I just don't have a clue. Well, I write because I enjoy writing. I would not do this job if I didn't. I have stories. Well, you've been about, doing this since what, 2009 too? Oh. So is this true or <laughs> way before that? I've been doing this since uh, 2004. Wow. Okay. What was your first book? Uh, my first, let's see, my first, I first wrote for, uh, role-playing games and that was Holy Order of Stars and Time of the Twins for Margaret Wives. Oh my God. I love that book. So I wrote for those two role-playing game, uh, modules. 
uh, and then I did a lot of. Oh, like, you're in Seattle. Yeah. I love Seattle too. You're in the best place for role playing games ever. Uh, it's pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you, did you work for TSR? No, no, I've worked for uh, Margaret Weiss and Silver Stone. I, I've done work for... Uh, Did you White meet her? Margaret? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Oh, man, how, what is she like as, a, as an author or as a person, as an entity? I loved her books. I loved her and Tracy Hickman's books. Um, they were my role-playing... They were my D&D books growing up. Well, not growing up. I discovered them when I was in the Army, but I loved their work. So my you need to tell me that... They were, she was a very sweet lady and a wonderful person. She she is a very sweet lady. <laughs> I, I wrote a book with her called um, Drag, Adventures of Dragon Borrowed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons I, I quit my uh, day job to do full-time writing. And uh, my book never never saw the light of day. But I wrote a book with her, uh, 64,000 words in eight weeks. Nice. Yeah. What and, was that experience like? That was back in, that was uh, 11 years ago. So I remember there was a lot of writing. I remember they really liked it. <clears throat> and then the people who published her Dragon Borrowed trilogy decided, I don't remember why they decided not to do Adventures of Dragon Borrowed or Dragon Borrowed Adventures. Um, but we had a cover and everything. It was, I was very young. And mm -hmm. I was very excited and excitable. I mean, one of the first co-written books I wrote with was uh, uh, something about Castle Morn with uh, Ed Greenwood. And I came to Gen Con and signed the book with him. So, <clears throat> yeah, and that's- So and your first experience writing a professional manuscript was with a published author, a famous one at that, with a gigantic fan base and the publisher said no thank you well no there's there was something about the fact that it was a role-playing game supplement officially so it didn't go through for publisher there are certain ironclad things with contracts that you know they get right a first refusal for the next book and because it was uh it was uh, a, actually kind of a cross between a, a role-playing game supplement and a novel uh-huh it just but it just still though i mean what what an interesting way to start your career right well, i mean that's better than any mfa program or or whatnot that you would get yourself involved in right i mean the lessons you would have learned and then from that point did you write fiction next uh i I've, I've been writing fiction the whole time but i was writing it for gaming characters it wasn't until hmm, I have a would couple. Be, of like, would you classify that as like fan fiction or uh, the Dragon World stuff? Would like uh, writing for game characters? Oh yeah, that well, that's that would be, I guess, fan fiction. Yes. Uh, what kind of I game characters? What? What kind of game characters? Oh, vampire! Oh, such melodramatic, like purple masquerade type situation. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I played I that game. That, and I wrote for Mage, and I wrote for D and D. In fact, oh. my very first professional fiction sales were to Campaign Magazine. I wrote um, a series of uh, of short fiction called Tales of the Hut Tankard. That sounds fantastic. Uh, they they were they were fantastic. They're also really horrible. <laughs> I was very young. I am so much better. Now. What's happened to that magazine? Is it still around uh, or did it, did it no, tank? No, that magazine, uh, I only think it was around for 10 or 12 issues. Um, I did I did RPG reviews for them, but I also did RPG, RPG reviews for Blackgate magazine as well. So, I mean, at these, did you get paid for those or oh, yeah. did, was it just kind of, oh, did you really, I mean, what, does stuff like that exist nowadays? It's basically all free online, like. Well, and, uh, the era of the magazine is is shifted to online and online subscriptions for the most part. There are some that are still around, Asimov, um, Analog, uh, Black. I wonder if Blackgate's still physical. I don't remember. 
It's like most stuff has moved online. Nobody buys physical copies anymore. I was looking into as um the Asimov. Mm -hmm. Oh, you just mentioned Asimov, didn't you? Yes. That's still. I think you can get physical copies of that. I think they sell them in batch, uh, like bulk now. But they do nine bucks. What's that? I think they do them quarterly. Quarterly, to get one of every four months or so. Yeah. Yeah, that's like the the cream of the crop. <laughs> Have you ever gotten anything in Asimov? Not yet. No. That that is no. still on the bucket list. I was looking at what they're looking for. I was like, huh, can I write something for them? It's interesting. So tell me about the thing that I was reading on Reddit. Which like thing? a whole it was um well I was looking for it before I got you on uh on the hangout. It looked like you were working with a bunch of different authors. Uh that might have been um Last Cities of Earth based on Jeff Sturgeon's artwork. That particular project uh, has shifted focus, and we're no longer working uh -oh. on the anthology. So at this point, um, what I am working on right now is the Battletech Young Adult Trilogy, which is the seminal Battletech uh, Young Adult Trilogy. It's, it will be uh, set in between the very last Age of Destruction and what's coming up next. So it will kind of be a, a mini step stone from what's out there to what's coming. So you're constantly moving, like one thing to shifting focus, seeing what will work, what's gathering steam. This might look like it, it'll catch tension or, I mean, well, I, I, I do a lot of things. Um, I do a lot of time in fiction. Um, some of which I still can't talk about because it's not out yet. And like, I I did um, Shadowrun novella, and I have a Shadowrun novel coming out later. But I also do original fiction, and I just finished the first draft of the first of a new series I'm calling Fever County. I've got to redline that and get that fully edited before I hand that off to my agent, and hopefully Fever County. Fever County. It's a team. That sounds like, oh, please tell me that's going to be a Western fantasy. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> Fever County is a cross between um, Goosebumps meets Lovecraft. Oh. So it's in the horror genre. And it's for, it's, uh, it's young adult. It's like older middle grade, young, young adult, kind of in that teenage, the teen section. You know what I like about you is that you know how to tickle the, the geek. You know how to do that thing. You know how to get your finger in that right spot because you keep doing it this entire conversation. You know how to make my my nerd gasm go. <laughs> 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 Everybody the series has really liked it. It's taken me longer to write this first novel than I wanted to, but is it's a first novel in a series of Second World. Uh, I have to get it right. I actually commissioned a map from um, Elizabeth Guetti, who is a comic book artist. Uh, local mm -hmm. me. Uh, do you only deal with the local, like Puget Sound area um, artists and writers, uh, or do you, you spread I, out I, a little bit? I'm all over. I, okay. I do 100% remote, so even though um, Beth is, is local to me. Um, we have worked on a couple of projects together. Uh, she will actually be coming by my house next week to talk about a particular project that we have that now that it's about done, what we're going to do with it. Because we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> we're just creating. We, I, so, are you a gamer? Yes. Still? Yeah. How much do you game on a, on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis, would you say? Well, like, if you can like, give me, like, an hourly. Well, I would like <laughs> to, um, I do primarily tabletop. Okay. Uh, I would like to do a weekly game, but the most we can manage right now is an every other week game, and I play Pathfinder. You do uh, a Pathfinder game? Yeah. Uh, I discovered that if I, there's a couple of things I've discovered about gaming. If I or if I play um, Star Wars, it actually feels like work to me because I'm always, I write in that genre. Really? Yeah. 
Oh, man. Yeah, I would love to. I've only done one session of Star Wars, and it seemed like a good game. It seemed like a cool game. You know what I mean? That tabletop RPG. Oh, yeah. It's very, very good. I enjoy it a lot. I'm actually very excited for the, the new uh, West End version coming out. I've not heard of it. Uh, let me see if I can find it online. Because right now there's there's a, the Fantasy Flight Games version. Um, there's the, the West End, old, the, the, the FASA old version. Let me see, Star Wars. New. So why Pathfinder and not just uh, D and D three point five? Well, three point five, three point five. So that's three point five. Okay, so um, uh, D and D when we played D and D four, it was actually it went back to very much um, the miniatures role playing game, yeah, tactical game. That, and the problem that uh, my husband, who's the GM, had was that when you get into epic levels, you didn't feel epic. You just got more stuff. I like the minis, but I didn't like the video game feel of it. Kind of well, um, yeah. uh, spend the spell and then there you go, whatever you got. Right. I like the mini and the map part. And when you went to five, it, the uh, DB fifth edition has some really interesting uh, me mechanics to it that mm -hmm. we looked into but we decided that um we knew pathfinder better and he he has been playing us running us through like rise of the rune lords and right now we're in uh curse of the crimson throne and then of course he throws in his own little bit uh, the That's other the home homebrew games are the best i i've played some pathfinder i i had a dm that did a lot of 3.5 D D, and i like a lot i don't even see any point in going up before or five. i played a little bit of five and i haven't really investigated enough of it to have an opinion at this point well people, There's no like, sick. people hmm? like what they like um and what they're familiar with um, yeah, I guess that's the point. I don't really, I haven't really developed an opinion about any of it. I love it all, honestly. Yeah. I haven't had, I mean, I even like the original. I love the the idea of playing a dwarf, just play a dwarf as a class. <laughs> <laughs> play old school. Yeah, I love it all. I mean, I unfortunately, I just in my life hadn't had much of an opportunity to play much of it. Well, if you ever get a chance to play 7th C, that's a, that's a, a swashbuckling adventure game that I, I highly recommend. That is a very interesting mechanic where you can uh, gamble, you can you can make things harder on yourself, but if you if you win the day, your reward is that much better. That's what I love about Seattle and that whole Puget Sound area from Olympia up. There's just a whole bunch of you know uh, gaming geeks just all over the yep. place. games. They love their tabletop. It's just fantastic. It's really cool. Yeah. And I don't really play video games because I tested video games for a very long time. Uh, I did play some more when I wrote for Shadowrun Returns, the video game um, from Harebrained Schemes. I did play that game through and I enjoyed it a lot. But it did, it, it, I, the back of my mind, I was kept, I kept thinking, well, how would I do this in a story? So, it's very interesting. I took a game writing seminar at NYU not too long, well, a few years ago at this point, and it was very fascinating to listen to. Um, it was the woman who wrote... <laughs> oh, man. I, I hate my brain. It does not want to work. Um, you don't play video games, so maybe it doesn't matter if I don't remember the name of it anyway. There was a game set during the 50s fallout? they went under what what is it called is it fallout or is it, is it bioshock the woman who wrote bioshock taught this seminar it was fantastic you know she went through the process of of uh how this this uh the process worked for her as the lead writer and um it was basically her just talking and um uh you said you wrote um shadow run yes which i'm gonna look up shadow run because i think maybe i played it i'm not much of a gamer either i 
like the online role playing games like your EverQuest and your your WoWs. I can get addicted to those. Shadowrun. Well, Shadowrun Returns is an old school turn based game. And I really I prefer turn based games uh, if I'm going to play them because I don't I don't play Twitch games very well. I don't like Twitch games either. I like uh, Baldur's Gate was a really good one, which I this seems like it would be a Baldur's Gate type game to me. Um, yeah, I'm looking at images of it right now. So you wrote this? I wrote on it. Yes, I, I wrote, wrote on it. Like, and I mean, uh, Jordan Weissman and Mitch Glittleman, and there were other authors, but I was one of the ones who took the original uh, Shadowrun Returns, and we wrote all the dialogue. Um, wrote a couple of the adventures. Um, I didn't get the whole thing um, because, well, one, I, I'm fairly expensive, and two, they, they had a serious uh, time crunch. So I was on the first version. They have Hong Kong and Denver, I believe, so two other supplements to Shadowrun Returns, both of which mm -hmm. are very, very good. So you prefer to write on tabletop games than to write for video games? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, okay. I would imagine uh, there's, that. There's yeah. very different. Okay. So when you're writing, okay, there's three different types of game writing. There's video game writing, which is script writing. You are writing in code. You are, um, you are formatting the the phrases of the words, um, the dialogue tags, and you have to write very, very economically um, within a very short amount of time. And you have to basically convince the player to go and do the same thing over and over and give them a good story while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're writing tabletop, you are doing, when you're writing the sports books, you are explaining the world, enhancing the world, and generally uh, making it understandable. Um, you're building out, you're doing all the world building and the political building and the religious building, um, along with the statistics and you're doing all the math involved. And then there's uh, tie-in writing, which is pure fiction that expands enhance, and enhances the role-playing game. Um, so that anybody who plays the game will recognize what you are writing and see how it is enhanced. And anybody who doesn't play the game will still enjoy the story. Is and that these, something like the WoW books or the D&D books, like the Tracy Hickman, Margaret Weiss books yes. that would come out for Dragonlance or whatever? Yes. So I'm, I'm more familiar with the books than I am the game that comes with it. But So I would fall into that latter category. Now, I don't write the source book, the source material anymore. Uh, and it was, I think the last one I did was for Cubicle 7, for Andrew Peregrine um, Cabal. And, and he basically asked me to write up uh, a secret society. Uh, and I did because, you know, I had a good idea. Uh, and he's a friend and I'm willing to, to do that. Um, I will occasionally write for video games when they're local, they pay enough, they, they meet my rate, and, you know, I have the time. Like right now, I have a trilogy, two novellas, three short stories, and a myriad of other things that are now on my plate. I, I am booked out through 2019 with some small exceptions. Would you ever say no? I mean, is that I say no all Something the time. that you would recommend, do you? Okay. You have to learn how to say no. The, once you get good, uh, and uh, the publishing houses know that you're good, especially during tie-in, uh, you have to learn to say no in order to save your sanity, and you don't burn yourself out. Mm -hmm. I had my agent negotiate nine months between each young adult book for a battle tech. Well, I wanted 12, they, they wanted six. And she, she ended up, you know, splitting the difference. And I'm okay with that. Uh, Does it actually take you nine months to write one? Well, so- Well, I mean, uh, I don't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> it, it is tie-in fiction. So I have to get them to approve the outline first. So uh, if it's not tie-in fiction, it takes me a lot less time to write it. 
um, I, I've been, I said that Fever County took me longer than I wanted it to. It took me, you know, four months instead of two months, but I also had six weeks of house renovation happening in the middle of that. Oh, horrible. How long is an outline? Like not, how long blame page wise is an outline? Okay, so outlines are different by the person. My personal outline is something that's basically like this. It's three or five acts long. Within each act, I figure out what the top three to five points I want to get through that act, and I write a single sentence about them. Uh, the way I write, I know each one of those sentences can become an entire chapter. And I will end up writing about two to three thousand words per. So five acts, five scenes within each act that that starts out being between um, let's see, fifty and let's three times uh, fifty and seventy-five thousand words, depending on how I write. Uh, most of them hit on the first bare bones is about sixty thousand words. Um, when it comes to writing tie-in fiction, it's anything from starting with a two-page synopsis to um, then a much more detailed outline. And now, again, this is just the way I do it. Uh, I know an author, J.A. Pitt, who does his in an Excel spreadsheet where he will have almost 10,000 words in his outline, whereas I have maybe 500 outlines are personal things it's it's what do you what works for you i know people who do the mind mapping thing which i do not understand i'm very much a linear top-down approach person especially when i write so an outline a synopsis will be between three and five pages and that'll be 250 double space 250 words per page um, an outline itself, depending on uh, you know how how detailed you have to get. Um, sometimes you'll have to do a paragraph per scene, and I will probably end up having to do the paragraph per scene for the Babel Tech for each outline. So, so when you're writing short fiction, which do you enjoy doing more? Which do you consider heart and soul? Is all of it your heart and soul, or do, is there something that you, you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to do, but the other stuff gets in the way? You, I, it goes in cycles. There will be some cycles where I don't want to touch short fiction at all, and that then there will be sometimes that's all I want to do. Right now, I'm I'm moving into the novel lane, so I don't really want to do a lot of short fiction. I mean, I'm already contracted for some short fiction, but it's for projects I already know about. I, I, I thought about um, sometimes I'll do collaborations with other authors uh, and they will do the, the first the first draft or we'll do a back and forth thing. Um, I like writing. I like yeah. doing stories. Some of the stories are short and some of them are long. And that's, that's I like writing too. I like saying where I end up. It's tough though, because nowadays it almost seems like you need to develop some kind of audience to get attention. Well, you and, do. Yeah, and uh, that's why I wanted to bring this conversation around too, because it almost seems like you started writing before that was kind of necessary. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. It was. It was. I started writing before I realized it was necessary. I don't. I can't say that it wasn't necessary back in two thousand four. Um, Different world though, right? I mean, the internet wasn't really as prevalent then. No, I would disagree. It was there, right? Because yeah. I was online. I was playing EverQuest. I was doing my thing on the internet. I, I've social had, media I've, wasn't there. It wasn't yeah, Facebook. It wasn't Twitter. No, it was a. Uh, it was MySpace. It was MySpace. But uh, Dane Cook was doing his thing on MySpace. He was becoming world famous on MySpace. And you've got right? the universe and such. Uh, it, it, each each new social media outlet has its its entrepreneurs and stars. I mean, I have an email address from 1994 that I still use. Hotmail, Yahoo. 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 Yeah, uh, my Hotmail 
was from 1972. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I tend to keep that one because it's the one that's been around the longest, um, but it's not the one I do a lot of business with. It's the one that I do a lot of personal stuff with. Um, well, my wife is the only one that sends me emails to it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did, I did actually get rid of an email account that I'd had for 20 years and that was like getting divorced. I had <laughs> so many things linked into it and I had to go through all the process of getting out of that and changing it over. Yeah. And it was, it was horrible. Just, I still occasionally find something that has the old email address on it and I, I have to be like, nope, nope, that one doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, my, my first Gmail account, I just gave up. I haven't given it up. I still send trash to it all the time, but I'm not using it for anything other than just, you know, <laughs> exactly that, just getting spam sent to it. So 2004 That's is when, when you first writing. started. I mean, well, you're, you don't really need the social media in 2004, but 2017, you do. You need the Twitter, you need the Facebook, and you're on there, right? I mean, you're on Reddit right now. That's where I discovered you, and it's interesting, making the connections that you're making. I, I Most of the time, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. I've started an Instagram account, but it's... How do you use Instagram, right? As a writer? I mean, that's what my question is. Well, I was you, thinking you find an image and maybe you throw some words underneath it. I don't think there's a limit. But, okay, so here's the thing about Instagram. I call mine mostly cats because it is. Oh, really you're a cat lady. I heard your cat in the background. I was going to comment on it, but we were just getting yeah. started, so I thought I would leave it alone. Four <laughs> you have four cats? Yes. I'm, I'm you're poor. Do you have a dog? No. No, your poor husband. My husband loves my cats. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is allergic to cats, or I'd have one too. I love cats. I grew up with cats and dogs. Yeah, I grew up with dogs, um, and so did my husband, um, but we both really like cats. I used to foster kittens um, oh, yeah. when I was in California. My dream is to have a Russian blue, even though I really don't know what they are. I just like the idea of a Russian blue. Well, Russian blues are um, friendly, kind of, um, they're round, they're very soft, they have a beautiful blue-gray coat. They they can be extremely expensive if you want to get a purebred. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, just rescues. I like rescues. Yep, rescues are one of the best ways to go. The the thing, the reason my husband decided we were going to get purebreds is he watched me um, foster kittens, and kittens have a high mortality rate, and he couldn't, he didn't want to deal with that, especially kittens who might have hidden um, illnesses. But I've rescued personally sixty six kittens, so. Oh. I didn't feel bad getting purebreds. So, but um, before we got distracted, oh yeah, uh, Instagram, your kitty cats. Oh, in Instagram. Now, here's the thing about Instagram. Um, for the young adult market, it's huge. Yeah. And one of the things that they do is uh, you do uh, YA on Instagram. You know, there, there's the writers of Instagram. Um, you put up your book in an interesting way where like you prop it up against your cat or something and you put that interesting picture up there and then people will look at that and they'll be like, Oh, you're an author. Oh, you do young adult stuff. Um, I like it as a different type of media for me to play with. That's all visual because when you're an author, it takes so long to go from the written book to the publication, unless you're an indie. Um, and even then, you know, you're getting the editor and a really good book cover and you're doing your due diligence. Um, I don't think I could write a, a new book every four months. Um, R.L. King, who does the Alistair Stone Chronicles, she's got 11 out now. Mm -hmm. um, they are going like gangbusters. And, and I talk with her on a regular basis. She writes you know, 150,000 words and gets it edited, um, professionally edited. She gets professional covers and she does it with each book within four months, which wow. is crazy. That's crazy. But then again, she has full control over it. The, the difference between an indie publisher, um, small press and traditional press is how much control do you want? For my small press stuff, I usually get... Um, consulted on the covers 
on my big five stuff, I didn't even see the covers until they hit Amazon. They didn't ask me anything. How, I mean, with that and watch, watching, excuse me, watching your friend being able to make her own decisions, how frustrated do you get when, you're, when your stuff hits Amazon without any say at all? I, I don't get that frustrated because... At all. I mean, I have 100% control of my content. If somebody came in and said, you know, I'm going to put this up without talking to you at all, I'd be a little upset. I mean, granted, my content gets no sales at all, but still, at the same time, I'd be upset if see, nobody asked me a question. See, here's the thing. They, they have professional um, book artists. Um, the Shattered Shields anthology that I did with Brian Thomas Schmidt has a Todd Lockwood cover. I was very surprised. Who? Is that a name? Who is that uh, name? Todd Lockwood. He is a very well-known artist. He's actually local of Bonnie Lake, I think, to me. Uh, Todd Lockwood, he is also now an author. He does a, a, a series of dragon books. He's, he's quite famous uh, as an uh, artist, at least in the science fiction and fantasy community. Okay. Um, and he's a really nice guy. I very much enjoy talking with him. Uh, but I, my bucket list included, I'm going to get a cover from Todd Lockwood. Well, but you work so much, though, too. I guess you would have to slow down if you were going to take more control over your content. Because a, I would imagine that if you're an indie, you're going to have to, I mean, honestly, my life has slowed down a lot because of the other content that I put out. This so podcast here, takes up a large portion of my time. I, I do see. own a small press. I have published other people. Uh, I've been newer, uh Peter M. Ball, Wendy Hammer, um, and I know how much work it takes to get it published, get it edited, do all the back end stuff, get it into Lightning Source, get the POD, pay for it to hit Ingrams and BNT. Uh, my husband is the business part of Apocalypse Inc. Productions, and I am the creative director i do all the creative side he deals with the royalties he deals with the taxes he deals with all of those things and i don't have to and honestly that feels good right after having yeah. done it you're like okay, I'm much hands up <laughs> i just have to write i'm good with this this is all right i'm happy I, I write i edit um if someone else you know as long as it's a good cover uh i have to be willing to give up that control you and just so, get to write more. You just get yeah. to put your, you get to do what you want to do. And that makes you happy. By the big five than I do for small press. Now, right. I, I mean, I'm not Sarah King where I'm making huge amounts per month as an indie, uh, an indie author. Uh, she does amazingly well and mm -hmm. she treats it as business. And I, I don't, um, I don't make the kind of money she does. Now, if I did, I would probably never do traditional publishing, but traditional publishing also gets me a bigger audience. And I, that's why I don't have a problem being a hybrid author. I think hybrid mm -hmm. authors are the way to go. If you can get yourself traditionally published and still have the opportunity to self-publish, do it because then you'll have the audience in both arenas. So, so where, where do you, oh, there's, there's my voice, there's my voice again, there's my voice. what, hold on, maybe it'll go away. I have no idea what happened there. <laughs> okay, it's gone. Um, where do you see the future of publishing? I mean, we called 2004, it wasn't there, 2000, whenever Facebook hit, let's call that 2007, I remember getting my first invitation for the, for my account. Um, and now 10 years later, we're sitting on nothing new, right? For social media is king. You have to have an account, Instagram, uh, Instagram with cats and, and book covers. I mean, what's the next, uh, what's the next big thing? And, and how do you, how can you be on the cusp? Okay. Well, honestly, I, I stick to what I want to do. I wrote the Melissa Allen series because I said, Hey, I wonder what, if Stephen King had written Four Teenagers back in the day, what, what would that have looked like? I would want to read that. So I wrote it. Chasing the market will never make you happy. 
No, point. that's a really great point. And that's what the publishers are doing. That's what the agents are doing all the time, too. They're chasing J.K. Rowling Maybe. while rejecting her at the same time. It's just yeah. really funny to watch. If you write what you want to read, um, eventually what you have written will come back into vogue. Now, the problem with it coming back into vogue is that means those books that were chosen two years ago. If you want to know what's about to come out um, and be fairly popular in mainstream media, mm -hmm. look to see what movies are being planned to be made and released within the next uh, uh, in 18 to 20 months from now. Then, then you'll see. Like the new Predator movies coming out, there's been a bunch of Predator anthologies. Uh, they're getting good reviews. Um, the Vampire is still out of vogue, but it's not completely dead. Yeah, the Vampire never goes away, does it? Well, none of <laughs> it always ever. comes back. Everything comes back. Everything is similar. everything does. Zombies, werewolves. Right now, we're kind of into the supernatural witches and uh, warlocks and ghosts phase. That's that's where we are right now. We're going to shift back into um, vampires and aliens here very shortly. I'm not sure why aliens and vampires seem to, to go well together, but they do. Huh. And of course, traditional fantasy, uh, it has its, you know, Traditional versus epic versus um, uh, what is it? It's, it's traditional fantasy, epic fantasy, and I don't remember the third term. Oh, high fantasy. High fantasy involves elves. Traditional fantasy involves um, a second world where it's everybody's human, and then epic fantasy involves very large battles. So it's just that everything is cyclical. Everything does. Yep. And right now, the, the, the hottest market out there is the young adult arena because there's a lot less pigeonholing going on. Well, that and romance. Romance never goes out of vogue if nope, you can stand it. <laughs> romance writers, are they have got it going on. Yeah, they, they really do. You go to a, a romance writer's uh, conference and you will learn a lot of things i wish i wrote romance yeah me too <laughs> it's just not what i do i don't tend to write stories that involve whether or not a relationship happens is, is super important um i unfortunately write what's ever in my heart and i don't really care <laughs> well, that's, that is the advice i can give everybody out there don't chase the market write what you want to read write what inspired yeah. you. because this industry is very very hard and even if you're writing um and your emotions are on your sleeve there's going to be someone out there who loves it and there's going to be someone out there who hates it you know what the most important thing is you try to love it write the best story that you can write right i mean that's ultimately the best advice i would give I agree. nobody's asking me for advice though we're asking you for advice and i do i don't ha you know what i do every single time i start a podcast i mean to start a timer <laughs> that I never do. I forget every single time. I think we're running at an hour though, but I'm not quite 100 percent sure. Well, it's and about I, I, six ten right now. What's that? It's it's six ten, and I don't remember if we started at five or not. I think we started a little bit before, but I'm not sure. But I do appreciate so much you um agreeing to do this with me and and coming on and and talking. Um, where are we at? Do we miss anything? I know we've been all over the place in terms of your career, and it's been a spectacular one. I'm I'm very jealous of the stuff that you put out. Looking at I your work website, very, very hard to get where I am. Well, no I doubt. Mean, I, I don't did. doubt that you're you're hardworking, and you know, if I could have, uh, um, I don't know where you where what advice do you give people when they come to you and say how do they how do they achieve the half the success that you have? I don't give up. I, Don't for, every, give up. for every success you see, I've tried something and it's failed. Uh, I mean, this whole podcast thing, which, you know, here's my shout out, five minute stories. It starts on the 19th. By the time you hear this, the first one will be out there. Uh, you, 
you just try something. I'm trying a, uh, a comic book because I've always wanted to do one. I, I'm doing tie-in writing because I like writing in the universe that I agreed to write in. It is, it is kind of a follow your heart. It's your head in the clouds, feet on the ground. It's a business, but it's also a joy. So I, I, I've done this. I, I've, I've been on my own since 2000, uh, working full time, um, freelance since 2006. I keep a very, very good accounting on my schedule. Understand what you can write, when you can write, when to say no, when to say yes. And realize that if you don't have confidence in your own writing, nobody else will. So you have to be to believe in yourself and believe in your writing and you know talk about it talk about your joys talk about your fears talk about the the fact that i tried the podcast and my cat was snoring and you could hear it <laughs> I had to redo it you know i'm i have to write a blog post about everything i learned about podcasting because yeah. i've done it before yeah so, that was a i honestly thought that was a very nice it was very short right it was a very short episode introductory episode but you did a great job thank it was almost you. it was perfect and I mean, I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, thank you. My uh, husband does all the post-production stuff. And as it turns out, he really likes doing the post-production stuff, which means I'm probably going to write a, an original series, a fictional series going forward. But yeah, that'll be in my copious amounts of free time. Hey, but, copious. I like <laughs> the sarcasm. You Pacific <laughs> Northwestern, yeah, you just do it so well too. It's like common, it's like conversational, the sarcasm. Us New Yorkers, we just we just we spit it out. And it's like sarcasm, but you guys, you just do it like it's conversational. It's like, yeah, I bet you have thoughts. Oh no, that was sarcasm. Yeah, <laughs> it's subtle about it. Subtle sarcasm, yes, it's it's like that. Uh, it's so wonderful, and like it was wonderful talking with you. I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, right. What I I also I I like to finish up with uh, knowing what you're reading too. Oh, what I, actually, let's see, what am I reading right now? Well, in front of me actually is uh, The Insider's Guide to Getting an Agent by Lori Perkins. I'm doing, I'm reading that so that I can remember how to do synopses correctly. On my do you have it? You don't have an agent? I have an agent. Uh, it's in here is a whole thing on how to write queries and synopses and I have to write about 12 synopses before the end of the year so would you sure. would you recommend new writers seek agents out before publishers or would it go publishers and then agents or would I you skip both of them and just the audience first and then okay i both recommend would come you if you're popular you enough you write first you finish the book then finish the then book absolutely finish the book finish what you start and then determine what you want do you want to just get it published then you go indie rep do you want to get it um in front of the big five and then you look for an agent and you start going to the conventions and, and meeting people you you do the grips and grins uh if you don't if you don't really want to be in charge of it but you don't want to um spend wait that much time then you look for the smaller press you know, determine how much control you want. Determine what else. Uh, also, what else am I reading? I am currently reading uh, an anthology called Urban Allies by Joe Nassi. And then I just picked up um, a mystery by Gene Ravy called The Dead of Night. The Dead of Night. So you not only write tons of things at the same time, you read tons of things oh, at the same I, time. I absolutely do read uh, a lot. and. Uh, I think, honestly, if you're going to be a, a, a writer, you do need to read. And I think you need to read outside your genre. I think you need to read nonfiction. Um, I, I, that's why I read mysteries. That's why I read um, uh, nonfiction. But I also read within, I read science fiction fantasy. I've just read The Brightest Fell by Shonda McGuire, which is coming out, or has just come out. And then it's I read the writers it, fell. Oh, ooh, it's, it's book eleven in the October Day series. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, It's book eleven in the October Day series, the brightest fell. And then I read 
Shannon is also Mira Grant, so I, I got an arc from her uh, um, Within the Drowning Deep, which actually is a sequel to a novella she wrote for Tor.com, I believe. Oh, interesting. And it was, it's about killer mermaids, and it's awesome. Is it on the website? Or is it just published? Uh, let's see. Let me let me see if uh, Mira Grant. Tor.com is awesome because they actually have a lot of fiction on it. It's yeah, really so, fantastic. Let's see. Into the Drowning Deep is still in pre-order. Uh, it comes out um, on the 14th of November. Let's see. Where is that set? I'm pretty sure she's got it. I'm pretty sure it's Tor.com. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. That was a subterranean special. Oh, that I cannot remember uh, what it was originally called. I I own like two thousand books, so <laughs> I, I feel I like I have two thousand books on my phone. Honestly, I stopped buying them like five years ago. Well, I I actually read a lot on ebooks right now because I don't mm -hmm. like um, looking for my reading glasses. Oh no, that's yeah. horrible. And if you're looking for nonfiction books to read, I, I recommend um, Christopher Hadfield's uh, An Astronaut's Guide to Living on oh, Earth. I read that. Was that not fantastic? Book? Yeah, it was really, really good. And then um, The Design of Everyday Things. I have thing. that on my list, yeah. Fabulous. So. Actually, that's been, that's been out for a while, hasn't it? It has. I, I yeah. tend to buy um, nonfiction books that I'm very interested in, and I don't get to them until later. Uh, sometimes I will read um, uh, the the How Done It series, which is a bunch of nonfiction books on how things are done. You know, missing persons, murder one, and such like that, just to see if any of it will inspire me. Um, you know, my, uh, a book that I'm reading right now that you might really get a kick out of. Um, it's called Sapiens. Yeah. It is a, a history of us humans, um, starting back 2.5 million years ago. Basically, just discover, uh, just writing about the various species of humans, and then uh, it pars it down to uh, uh, basically us. Um, I have kids. I have two uh, two-year-old twins, and they are killing my time along with everything else. So I'm um, having a terrible time finishing it, but it is just a magnificent read. This is why I like audiobooks and podcasts. I can do something else while I listen. Yeah, I totally. But uh, I highly recommend it. I mean, just the way he looks at humans and the way we live is uh, very, very interesting. Though I really wish I could hurry up and finish it, though, as well as my novel. I want to finish it so I can get to the next one. Ugh, I have so many <laughs> things I want to finish. <laughs> um, my last for you is uh, where can we find you so we can enjoy your career along with you? Well, uh, my website is jenniferbrozek.com. I am on Twitter as Jennifer Brozek. I'm on Facebook as Jennifer Brozek. And there is a Facebook fan page called Jennifer Brozek Author. Uh, what did I call my Instagram? I don't remember what I called my Instagram. My Instagram is called Jennifer underscore Brozek. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm generally Jennifer Brozek everywhere. Um, there are a couple of other Jennifer Brozek's. One's an archer, one's a realtor, and one is a, I believe she's, she's a runner. So. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm the only author out there right now. Though about seven years ago, I did have a, another Jennifer Brozek just finish, um, a writing degree coming out of college and was trying to get the jenniferbrozek.com website and then discovered there was a Jennifer Brozek author already. And she's like, I guess I need that a student now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I guess you do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hope that uh, she she got out there and is doing really well. And if and, and she happens to somehow hear this, I would love to say hello to her. Uh, right. Because I've always been curious to see how she did after that that one email to me. Uh, she's writing under Jenny Brozak. 
<laughs> I hope not. With an eye. Well, maybe. So. She's romance. She's doing fantastic. Most likely. If she's romance, <laughs> got it going on. Because let me tell you, romance <laughs> authors are nothing to sneeze at. They, they have got the business part of writing down. My hat yeah, is It's the business part down. that I have a problem with. It's the business part. <laughs> I have friends that do it very, very well, but I am not of their ilk. Just, I, it's, yeah, no excuses. <laughs> but hey, I, I totally enjoyed this conversation. And again, thank you so much for being willing to sit with me for the last hour and uh, hash out writing and, and life and creativity. And I hope to have you back on. In fact, I have another podcast called Mirage. If you want to talk uh, actual specific speculative writing topics or authors, you're more than welcome to join me again for another hour and we'll we'll do something like that. I believe I'm going to be doing a workshop with Kat Rambo on, I believe, the 14th of October about how to pitch stories and what the difference between a synopsis and a pitch is. Okay. So that, that's, that's something else I'm doing. So I tend to, to do workshops and help out other authors. Cat Rambo. I've never heard of the name, but that's definitely a cool... Well, Cat Rambo is currently the president of the of CIPLA, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of uh, America. Oh, okay. One of the big professional um, uh, writing organizations out there working to better um, every better things like uh, copyright laws and such for writers. I think you need something like uh, $3,000 or something like that in sales to join it or something along those lines. If, you, I'm if you're an indie, you do need to within a year. And if you are self, if you are uh, professional, not professionally, traditionally clubbed, I believe you have to have two or $3,000 advance per book. And if you're doing short stories, they have to be pro- uh, paying, which is currently six cents a word. So sifwa.org, uh, sfwa.org, um, there are guidelines on how to qualify. I will add that to the notes. I think all authors should know of that organization's whereabouts. Well, you should also know about the Horror Writers Association as well, which is the HWA. Uh, I believe it's horror.org. Okay. Uh, they are for horror writers, and they also um, have a professional. Uh, I wrote dot com for the first one, but it is dot org, right? Dot org. Uh, okay. Let's see, it's syslid dot org, and it is, and let's see, horror dot org for the Horror Writers Association. All right, fantastic. That's definitely things that people should be aware of. Helps them. Helps everybody. Okay. All right. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye-bye.